Can I introduce now Michael Sifra, who is based at the Institute of Photonics and Electronics of the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. He was ed uh, editor of a recent excellent uh, book, The Fields of the Cell. We recommend you look at this. And he's going to give us an overview of electric fields in biology. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. So thank you very much for inviting me to give this overview. And I, of course, this is a huge topic, so I really just scratch the surface of one of the, the most important pillars of it. Before I go into I would like to say that uh, all the info I have, it's thanks to the, of course, reading the, a lot of literature, but also to my great team. It's really a really interdisciplinary, and I'm really happy I have all the people with me. So let's start first with the definition for those who might not be that much deep into physics. So what is elect an electric field? So basically, it's a component of a, a physical field, specifically electromagnetic field. And one of the components of this electromagnetic field is the electric one. And um, what does, how does it, how it's, uh, well, uh, how does it generate this electric field? So it comes, uh, the, this field is generated by anything which carries an uh, electric charge. Let me take a pointer. And for simplicity, we, we often visualize the electric field by the field lines, basically, because the electric field can exert force, which is directional. We also show arrows. And the more denser the arrows, the, the higher is the electric field strength. Uh, well, uh, this is the static picture. However, uh, down comes the, the spider. Uh, when the electric charge starts to move, this is a very slow down motion. What it starts to, basically is doing is visualization to the field line. It starts to uh, create oscillations in the field lines, which then propagate in velocity by the velocity of light, a fade from each other, basically creating electric oscillations and electric uh, uh, electromagnetic waves. So this is also an important aspect of of the electric charge, basically, which when it gets oscillating, it couples to the magnetic field. Now, so this is the origin of the electric field. It can be on molecules, on the cells, and so on and so on. However, um, uh, electric field also acts by force on electric charges. So electric field is generated by the electric charge and, char and acts by force of anything which does carry an electric charge. So why, why is electric field important for biology? I will start with something which probably nobody will dispute. Um, and that's that the biology, is, as we understand it, is based on biochemistry. Now, when you go to the details of the biochemistry, it's basically all about the interaction between the molecules and chemical changes. And but when you go to the deep of the, of the um, physical chemistry, including biomolecules, uh, we'll find that basically all the interactions within and between biomolecules, molecules in general, are based on electric or electrodynamic forces or lack of them. So this is important because that means that then biochemistry is based on electric fields, on electric fields of the molecules and their interactions. And it includes really all, all the interactions, including the wonder walls, which, which, are, which are basically the electrodynamic forces. Now, uh, let's have a look on that, on those, let's on a molecular scale. So let's have a look on indigenous biomolecular and also uh, biological electric fields. Uh, well, usually when people see the structure of the biomolecule, they well, they see there are some some, some sort of structure, some beta helices, alpha uh, um, uh, beta sheets, alpha helices, but they really well. Sometimes people don't really look on the electric field which is around the biomolecules. So you can see a beautiful, beautiful uh, RNA binding protein, and I particularly would like to highlight when people have a look on the electric field, basically. You can see a very um, very complex spatial pattern of this electric field. And I imagine these things also fluctuate and vibrate. It's really, really complex electric field which is present around each molecule. Now, this is of course beautiful to see, but also it's functionally important because uh, electric field local ones actually are the, also the ones which facilitate and, and uh, change the reaction rate. So they're also uh, important for uh, enzymatic activity because local electric field then can uh, catalyze the reaction. So that's also one of the hypotheses how the how the enzymes are working. Now going higher in the hierarchy, uh, electric fields are also intrinsic to to, elect, to the biological cells. And the cell membrane electric potential is basically as a hallmark of life. There are of course particle cases on a, of a, where the the transmembrane potential is close to zero, but in general. Um, the membranes are important for forming the, uh, the 
uh, electric field, electric potential across the membranes. Uh, going further and higher, so electric fields are uh, also crucial for functioning of the higher organisms, basically having a signaling function triggering the triggering our muscles, and also are important for information processing. That's what we know from the ECG and EEG altogether. Now, what is, I would say, kind of uh, overlooked aspect is that um, electric fields are mostly people are looking on those in biology for a rather, I would say, low frequencies. So typically what we know from classical electrophysiology, also on level of cells, people are looking at electric fields, which are uh, oscillating or, or fluctuating in the frequencies up to one kilohertz. So it's already considered a rather high frequency for, for, uh, for EEG, even if you have this heard it's causing a high frequency. Then on the other side of the electromagnetic spectrum, when we look from a physical perspective, what we see is a very high frequency oscillating uh, electric field is basically corresponding to, to optical radiation and infrared radiation. Also, we typically more would call it uh, um, electromagnetic waves or, or um, really it's hard to decouple than the electric component for the magnetic one. However, what is quite uh, underdeveloped so far is the exploration of the, of the frequency ranges in a radio frequency band and megahertz, gigahertz in terms of if these frequencies and, and uh, uh, of electric field are present in the cells and uh, if they could have any any role in in the bioelectrics of the of the life um i would now like to go very briefly on a uh, touching upon a uh, huge area of research of the effects of external electric fields on biology starting with, with uh what's our natural environment so everybody probably knows magnetic field of the earth but maybe a little bit people know a little bit less about the electric field which we are exposed and everything which is outside is exposed to. So thanks to the um, uh, electrical structure of the of the earth and its closest closest surroundings, basically it uh, represents a capacitor. So it's slightly conducting uh, well rather conducting earth, rather conducting ionosphere between there is rather insulating air. And we have a charging element here, which are the uh, lightning bolts uh, from lightnings from the from the uh, storms all around the world. And these basically charge up the the, the, the capacitor or leaky capacitor, which is represented by this these, uh, global atmospheric electric circuit. And what it practically means that all the time uh, outside, if you take a, a good sensitive voltmeter, you would measure that in the air. There is a potential gradient corresponding to a few hundreds of volts per meter, even to a uh, um, few kilovolts per meter in particular weather conditions. And this is also basically important because we are, that means that everything uh, which is present uh, uh, in this environment and Earth is exposed permanently to the also this uh, electric field strength. Now, uh, a very huge area of, of, uh, of knowledge was collected so far on uh, biological effects of external, be it natural or man-made electric fields. Um, one, starting hierarchically, uh, when we considering what are potential effects of electric field on biomolecules, of course, um, which is well known also in analytical techniques, uh, electric field will cause the electrics to, uh, to, to biomolecules to be dragged, basically by electrophoresis. If this field is strong enough, it can rotate the electric field, as for example, we show in this animation from the molecular dynamic simulations of the tubulin uh, protein in the electric field. And if the field is even stronger, it can cause deformation, structural change, and also functional changes. But again, this needs sufficient field strength. Uh, as always, there are certain threshold levels to achieve these uh, effects. Uh, going to the to the uh, higher, uh, oops, sorry, to the higher um, hierarchy of this, um, I can run the video. On the cell level, if the cells are exposed to electric field, they, um, they manifest uh, so-called electrotaxis or galvanotaxis. You can see the fluorescent images of cells and electric field direction. And there are a plethora of, of uh, many other dire effects on the, on the electric field on the cells, including cell division differentiation. And what is known so far, it is mostly for at least a lower frequency or static electric field is the membrane which, which is the primary target of electric field. However, the higher the frequency of the electric field is, the deep, the, the more structures the, the um, electric field is affecting also inside the cell within the membrane structures. 
Uh, well, on the level of organisms, there is a huge uh, bioelectrics and biostimulation uh, research and industry area, which, well, we know that electric field can stimulate uh, the variety of tissues for growth and regeneration and many, many others um, of effects. Now, last thing I would like to touch upon, which is most, uh, well, all controversial and also exciting. So now we know that cells can, well, generate, produce electric fields and also can respond to electric fields. So can the cells actually use these uh, their electric fields for mutually couple to each other and talk to each other using electric and electromagnetic fields? The briefly giving an idea, you can imagine that the cells are, the cells or environmental generate the, the field. They basically some, some interference and they're, they're interacting to that. So the simplified image that the cells could uh, e e uh, generate and send the electric field, electromagnetic field to use it for uh, for communication. And it's, it's a, there are a lot of, lot of interesting experiments also particularly for non-contact coupling between the neurons and, and so on and so on. So there's plenty of interesting info on this. I would like to highlight this one of the things we, we've covered and the book mentioned in the fields of the cell. And if people are more interested also more about the uh, electromagnetic based uh, biocommunication between the cells, I can recommend you some of these, some of these papers, which also I co-authored. So with this, I would like to keep it short so we can proceed. And I would thank you. And uh, for those I could just I'm just more in, in the bioelectrics and especially high, high frequency bioelectrics, I can refer to 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 these channels. So thank you very much. Michael, thank you very much indeed. And we'll take questions after after uh, after Michael Bean has has spoken. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Mike Levine, who has given talks on our in our series on a number of occasions, and he's one of our co-collaborators in uh, uh, for um, for uh, the uh, foundation-sponsored re research. So Mike is the Vannevar Bush Professor in Biology, Distinguished Professor of the School of Arts and Science, and Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts University. And he leads the, the Levin lab at, lab at the Allen Discovery Center. And uh, as I said, we're really delighted to be working on two projects with, with, with Michael at present. So Michael, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, at this uh, super interesting uh, meeting. Um, I would like to talk about regeneration and the most uh, obvious example of regeneration looks something like this. So this is a Mexican salamander known as an axolotl and they regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, their ovaries, spinal cord, uh, portions of their heart and brain. And the most amazing thing about this regenerative process is that uh, if uh, the, let's say the limb is amputated at different uh, levels here, the cells will very rapidly grow and undergo morphogenesis and they will recreate the exact same structure and then they stop. And this is perhaps the most interesting part of this is that uh, how, uh, when do they stop? They stop when a correct salamander arm has completed which raises the obvious question of how do they know what a correct salamander arm is supposed to be. And so this is kind of an example of something we call anatomical homeostasis because there is this, uh, there's this target morphology that the system will continuously attempt to reach despite various perturbations. Now, of course, this is not just for uh, salamanders and planaria, which I'll talk about momentarily. Uh, humans regenerate their liver, deer regenerate their antlers. So large amounts of bone, vasculature, um, innervation every year. Um, and uh, even human children regenerate their fingertips. And uh, I, I would like to make the point that regen this kind of regeneration is not a, a separate special ability that some animals have to deal with injury. This is a, an extremely fundamental capacity that, uh, you, that, that, that uh, universally across the tree of life, even, even uh, humans, have as a part of regulative uh, development. So what happens is that if you uh, take an early, uh, let's say an early human embryo and you split it in half, you don't get two half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And so the system is, is, high, is a highly, highly uh, regenerative and it's able to reach the correct target morphology despite very drastic perturbations. And so this raises a really interesting question. We, we all start life like this as a set of uh, embryonic blastomeres. They reliably build something like this. This is a cross section through a human torso with uh, incredible order in terms of uh, the, the, the spatiotemporal uh, pattern of the different organs and tissues and so on. But individual cells are, uh, look like something like this. So this is, this is of course, uh, a, a unicellular organism. This is a lacrimaria. But you, you, can, you can see what's happening here. The, the individual cells are very competent at 
uh, handling single cell goals. So physiological states, uh, 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 behavioral, uh, various behavioral repertoires, metabolic states, and so on. Uh, what is it that allows individual competent subunits, such as cells, to cooperate towards very large-scale projects? So this, the goal of building this kind of organism, and let's say in a, in a, in a salamander, the, uh, the ability to continuously recreate and repair a large-scale uh, pattern, uh, what what is it that allows that allows these things to uh, to co to co cooperate that way? And uh, in my group, we've been really thinking hard about this idea that that okay, the genome of course specifies the protein, so the micro level hardware that every cell gets to have. But actually, what what is this uh, this informational glue that allows individual cells to work towards large scale goals? And this is important because uh, pretty much everything in medicine, with the exception of infectious disease. Uh, tends to boil down to control of three-dimensional shape. So if we could convince a collective of uh, cells to build a, 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 any desired structure, we would have the solution to birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, uh, synthetic morphology, so adaptation to new conditions, all of that would be possible. And so one might, might imagine the, the uh, kind of end game for this field to look like something like this Some, someday in the future. There will be this uh, system which we can call the anatomical compiler, where you can sit down in front of a computer and uh, describe the anatomy and the functionality of the uh, organ or structure or animal that you want, uh, not at the level of molecular details, but actually at the, what, what you actually care about, which is, which is the functional anatomy. And then the system would compile that description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build whatever you want them to build. Now, notice that this, this idea, this anatomical compiler is not some sort of 3D printer that micromanages the position of cells. It's really the right way to think about this is it's a communications device. It's a translator for converting a system level anatomical description into the kind of uh, stimuli that would uh, convince a collective intelligence of a cellular swarm to build one structure versus another. And so, where we are today with molecular medicine is that we are very good at uh, uh, inferring and manipulating information like this. So gene regulatory networks, proteins, pathways, that kind of thing. But we're really quite a long way from, um, uh, contr from, from control of what we want, which is, which is large scale anatomical organ structure and function. And that's because I think, because to a large extent, biomedicine is still where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. It's exclusively focused on, uh, on the hardware. And what we really now need to do, and I think many people at this and, and the previous conferences have shown examples of this, of this paradigm shift, we need to start to exploit some of the biological software, the, the, some, of the, some of the higher level competencies of the system. And here's just a very simple example. This was discovered by Laura Vandenberg in my lab, where we found that uh, tadpoles that um, uh, become frogs, in order to do that, they have to rearrange their face. If you create what we call so-called uh, Picasso tadpoles, where everything is in the wrong place, so the eyes on the side of the head, the jaws are on the other side, you know, every, everything is scrambled, this system still makes perfectly good frogs, because in that example of uh, anatomical um, uh, homeostasis that I showed you, what happens is that, it, that what the genetics doesn't give you a hardwired set of movements for these organs, what it does is specify a machine that can minimize error. It can minimize error relative to a specific target morphology, and then all of these components will move through novel paths uh, as, as much as needed to, to try and get back to where they, where they need to go. So we've been studying this, this phenomenon for some number of years, this competency of, of, of collectives of cells to reach their goal by different means. This, by the way, is William James's definition of intelligence, uh, the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And so, so then one starts to wonder, well, do we have, an, do we have a, a precedent for this? What's an example of a collection of cells that clearly is able to store uh, some sort of uh, goals uh, state in some kind of space, be it behavioral or something else, and executes a flexible action to get there? And of course, the brain is, a, is an excellent example. And the brain use, uses uh, a well-known architecture, these uh, electrical electrically active cells in a network that uh, process information to achieve goals in three-dimensional space. But uh, the one, one really interesting thing about this is that evolution discovered this remarkable uh, uh, architecture, the, the, uh, the, the suitability of electrical networks for storing memories, for processing information, for integrating across space and time, discovered this a really long time ago. So basically around the time of bacterial biofilms. 
And uh, these are the exact same machinery. So the ion channels that set resting potential, the electrical synapses known as gap junctions that uh, selectively propagate electrical information across the network. All of this stuff is, is extremely ancient, including neurotransmitters, the same, all the same stuff. So uh, while, while uh, ancient uh, evolutionary uh, architectures were using electrical signals to, uh, to, to navigate morphospace, basically to, to allow cells to, to, um, uh, under, under, to detect errors and, and, and to reach the correct morphological state, this was all uh, uh, speed optimized and, and uh, altered in a couple of other ways to then underlie uh, electrical signaling in the brain and nervous system, which is where it's much more familiar. So we've been, we've been uh, working uh, to, to, to crack this, this bioelectric code and this idea of uh, understanding how it is that non-neural cells uh, uh, transmit and interpret electrical information. So we developed a variety of tools. Uh, this, is, this is an example of a voltage sensitive dye looking at electrical conversations between uh, early frog cells in time-lapse. So this was uh, done by Danny Adams. We do a lot of computational modeling to fuse the genetic information as far as which ion channels and pumps are present to the actual electrical states. You can see here a couple of examples of these states. This is um, a time lapse of a frog embryo putting its face together, and one uh, snapshot of that kind of um, that dynamic pattern shows you that here. This is this is again you're looking at voltage, the resting potential of these cells already before the genes are turned on that uh, regionalize the face. You can already see this is, this is where the system plans to put the first eye. This is where the mouth is going to go. This is where the placodes, the, uh, the second eye will come in thereafter. So this is, this is a normal uh, pattern, in fact, required for correct craniofacial morphogenesis. This is a pathological pattern. So if we put in an oncogene, you will get a tumor. But even before that tumor becomes uh, histologically apparent, you can already see the bioelectric changes that uh, are, that, that are driving these cells to disconnect from the electric network and basically go back to their single cell amoeba-like state. So, so, uh, so those are the tracking uh, kinds of technologies. This is uh, the even more important functional techniques, which, so we do not apply any fields. There are no electrodes, no magnets, no radiation, no electromagnetic waves. Uh, we try to play the interface that the cells themselves expose to, to each other and to us, which is these ion channels and pumps. So we have a variety of techniques, all stolen from neuroscience. So basically optogenetics, um, pharmacology, uh, mutations and channels and pumps and so on, which allow us to uh, control the, um, the, the connectivity of the network, the topology of the network, and of course, the electrical state of any particular cell. And when you do that, you can reach phenotypes like this. So for example, by injecting one single uh, type of RNA and coding a particular potassium channel, to set up a region of voltage that looks exactly like that eye spot in that electric face, you can convince a bunch of other cells in the body to make a perfectly good eye. So here, here are some gut cells making an eye because they received this, uh, this, this, this uh, potassium channel RNA that, that set a build an eye here kind of um, uh, a subroutine call. It, not, not, only do they, not only do they do that, but it's very clear that uh, the effect is not cell autonomous. It is not local because if you manipulate these cells here shown in blue, they will get their neighbors to help them build this nice lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole. We didn't, we didn't target enough of these cells, so, so they recruited their neighbors. And this is a nice example of a, of a swarm competency. Ants and termites do the same thing. They recruit their neighbors to help them finish a job, and you, and you can see that here. So, um, so I want to switch now uh, for, the, for the remainder of the talk to um, another model system in which uh, you can really quite see, see uh, how some of this plays out in regeneration and then say a couple of things about space uh, afterwards. So these are, these are planaria. Um, they are uh, uh, kind of a fascinating model system for a number of reasons. They are highly regenerative, so you can cut them into pieces. Every piece builds a perfect tiny little worm. So the, the, the old parts scale down, the new parts grow, and every piece uh, is, knows exactly what a correct planarian looks like. And so, so they are highly regenerative. They are um, basically immortal. Uh, they are very cancer resistant. Uh, they do this all of this with an incredibly chaotic genome, which they which they've accumulated because of their uh, somatic inheritance when they reproduce by fissioning and uh, and regeneration. And so, one thing that um, we were able to do in uh, in Planaria, and this uh, this the circuit was first uh, was first developed by uh, by Wendy Bean as a postdoc in my group, where we we 
simply ask the question, how does this little fragment here, this middle fragment, how does that fragment know how many heads it's supposed to have? And so normally you will chop it off here and you get one head, one tail. That's, uh, that's extremely robust and reliable. But you can also, uh, you can also take uh, this, this animal and from this middle fragment, you can get a two-headed worm. This is not Photoshop. These are, these are actual real animals. And the way you do that is by manipulating the state of this electrical circuit. And so now this, is, this work was done by Fallon Durant in my group. And what she showed is that whereas this is the normal bioelectric state that says one head, one tail, what you can do in this animal is produce, but you, you can produce animals that, that are anatomically normal, but they have this uh, altered bioelectrical memory of what a correct planarian is supposed to look like. The transcriptional, uh, the RNA states are normal, but the bioelectric memory says two heads. And so if you go ahead and cut this animal, it will then produce these two-headed animals. So that shows you the ability, and this, again, this is very, very uh, much like a precursor to what we see in neuroscience, where this, the exact same hardware can store multiple uh, memories of, uh, of, of what, the goal states, uh, what the goal states might be. It's a, it's a sort of primitive counterfactual memory, because this is not a map of this animal. This is a map of a one-headed animal that has a different representation of where in anatomical space it's going to go if it's injured. Now, um, I keep calling this a memory because, and this is uh, Nestor Oviedo's work in our group, um, what he showed is that if you take these two-headed animals uh, you will, and you cut them, do you remove the primary head, you remove this uh, crazy ectopic secondary head, and uh, they will continue to generate two-headed animals even though the genome is untouched. We, there was no genomic editing, there are no transgenes, this is genetically wild type, but they will continue to generate in perpetuity these, these two-headed animals. And in fact, we, we know how to set them back. This is also Wendy's work. We, we are now able to take two-headed animals, set them back to one-headed. And this really has all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable. It's rewritable. It has conditional recall, which is what I just showed you, that that pattern is a latent memory until it's activated by injury. Um, and it has d d discrete uh, possible behaviors that this, uh, that this morphogenetic agent is able to do. So, so the question of uh, how many heads does this species have and what controls it is kind of subtle. It's not actually genetically determined. What the genetics gives you is a, is a machine that reliably generates an electrical uh, circuit that stores the default state, which is one head, but it can actually store others. And not only can you find uh, uh, the, the, the other types of head number in morphospace, you can also find head shapes belonging to other species. And this is the, the work of uh, Maya Emmonsbell, a student in the, in the group who showed that you can take a uh, species with a triangular head and by perturbing the electrical connectivity between the cells for about 48 hours, they can generate flat heads like a P. felina. They can generate round heads like an S. mediterranea. Um, and of course, they're normal triangular heads. Um, not just the shape of the head, but actually uh, the distribution of, of stem cells and the brain shape will be like these other attractors that exist in morphospace. space. And uh, by shifting the, the electrical network state, you can, you can push the whole system towards these other kinds of target morphologies. Of course, there are other aspects of that latent space that you can reach, which don't look like planaria at all. So you can get these, these crazy spiky forms, you can get cylindrical ones, and you can get hybrid ones. And who knows what else is out there if, if, if we really knew how to, how to program this. So at the moment, um, what we're doing is uh, uh, merging some of the tools of, uh, of, of uh, connectionist uh, computer science in uh, all, the, all the frameworks that exist for understanding how networks can store information, how, uh, how they can recover um, lost information, how to merge the state space of this electrical circuit with a different space of representations of uh, what anatomically does the tissue think the correct answer should be. So these things, these things are now coming together. Uh, and, and some of the work that, uh, that, that the foundation is, uh, is, is supporting in our lab is going to be really, really critical for this. So um, we, of course, are moving this kind of stuff to, towards uh, regenerative medicine. And so this is uh, Kelly Chang's work, who showed that in vertebrates, you can, uh, you, can take, you can take frogs that normally do not regenerate their legs during this stage and treat the wound with a very simple intervention that basically pushes the cells towards a decision of regrowing what the normal uh, the target morphology is for this for this critter, and then then the downstream uh, regenerative genes will become turned on. The by 45 days, you've got some toes, you've got a toenail, and the leg is touch sensitive and motile, and eventually has a pretty good uh, distal distal end. And so at this point, uh, I have to do a disclosure because David Kaplan and I are um, co-founders in this company called Morphoceuticals. 
where we are attempting to do the same thing in in uh, in mammals. So so uh, uh, digit and then limb regeneration and then other organs in uh, in 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 mice and then eventually human patients, hopefully. So uh, the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to show you some uh, some of the. Uh, some of the work we had done uh, that relates to uh, to space travel. We were very fortunate to be part of this uh, project where they allowed us to send a bunch of worms up to the International Space Station. You can read you can read all about it uh, here. Uh, the worms were up there for about thirty days. Um, we were not able to get any uh, time points or or video during that time, so we only saw them before we sent them up, and we sent uh, fragments. So we we cut the we cut the animals, we sent them up there, then we recovered. Uh, a month later, we recovered what came down. So we don't know what happened in the in between stages. We saw a few interesting things. One of the things that we saw was that ab about one out of fifteen came back double headed. Now this is uh, this is a, actually a huge uh, error rate because they're normally much more stable than that. Uh, but uh, but we recovered some some two headed worms from that space experience. And the other thing is that checking them one year after. So this is a year, actually a little more than a year after they've been back on earth and in their normal incubator and sort of, they still had some odd behaviors. And this is a machine that uh, measures their uh, response to light and, and things like that. And what we found is that whereas, uh, whereas uh, normal, um, uh, normal, normal, the, the, their, their counterparts that had stayed on earth uh, have uh, sort of this kind of, uh, uh, a behavior that the, the where they like to stay in the dark most of the time even a year later these these animals that had been to space are actually much more willing to spend time in the light um so this is this is a very long-term behavioral change that was uh induced by their by their space travel experience experience and then the other thing that we observed is that their microbiomes have shifted and again this is this analysis it was done over a year after they've been back and so you can see that the, some some of these species and so these are just repeats uh, some of the species, like this uh, Chrysiobacterium, are uh, are high in this colony uh, again, even even a year after we're back. Now, there's some s s strong limitations in all of this. What what we do not know is which of these phenotypes are due to loss of gravity, loss of geomagnetic fields, vibrations on takeoff and landing, um, uh, radiation, all of the things that people have been talking about here. We really don't know, but all of those things are going to be present, presumably, in in space travel experience. And so, while we weren't able to uh, to 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 dissect them out, the the sum total of that experience made these these really deep changes. Now, this is uh, just the last uh, the last thing here is that is that these the, the changes in the microbiome. Is there any way to connect them to what happened to let's say morphologically to the animal? You know, why do they have two heads? Well, this other story that we developed with um, uh, Benjamin Wolf's uh, Ben Wolf's lab is that actually there are species of uh, bacteria that live on the planaria that uh, have the ability to alter their anatomy. And so if you, if you mess with the complement of the different bacteria, there's one particular, uh, there's one particular kind that uh, uses this compound called indole to alter the structure of the planaria. So you get these really weird, so here's the normal visual system. Here is what happens after they're exposed to this uh, bacterial indole. Their heads become very wide, their visual systems are kind of a mess. And some of them, in fact, end up two-headed. So there is potentially this uh, this 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 link, this sort of uh, what the, what this this triangle um, relationship between the the bioelectric anatomical signals, the microbiome, and the actual anatomical choices that these cells make. And so I'd like to uh, stop here. Um, thank the uh, the people who did all the work that I showed you. Um, our uh, our uh, technical support, um, our our funders, and especially the Guy Foundation. And uh, that's it. Uh, I'll stop there.